Hey everybody, welcome. Get settled in, because we get to spend an hour together digging into God's Word, singing together. And so right now, we're going to prepare our hearts for that, for getting into the Word and our message by singing right now. So let's do that. Let's praise Him.
freely give as I've been given for everything you've done and everything. a scripture from Psalm 147, 5. It says, Great is our majestic and mighty Lord and abundant in strength. His understanding is inexhaustible, infinite, boundless. 
And so when we sing this next song, we are saying that God's not done in this world or in us. As that scripture said, he's infinite and boundless. So let's praise him for that as we sing.
I can say is, wow, that was incredible. Thank you, band, for leading us in that time of, of praise. And, and that's what we're going to do right now. We're going we're gonna to give praise to God. You know, communion is, the more, the more we take it, the more we receive communion on a weekly basis together, the more we find just how incredibly rich and deep communion really is. The more we receive it, we just get reminded over and over again. And so what we're going to do right now is we're going to, through the act of communion, we're going to praise our Heavenly Father. We're going to give Him the praise and the honor and the glory that He is certainly due during this time of communion. And we're going to do that by, by praising Him and remembering as we receive the, the bread and the cup, and I encourage you to grab the bread and the cup right now, we're going we're gonna to praise him for his love. We're going to praise him for his willingness to send his son to the cross for us. We're going to praise him for that sacrifice. We're going to honor him and give him praise by acknowledging that very act that he has done for us. And that's really the richness of this moment right now is that we get to praise God. Now, here's the, here's the incredible thing about praising God. And this, this is the, always the way that it works in God's economy. The more adoration, the more praise that we, that we give to him, the more we give him of ourself and remember and honor him in all things, the more blessed we are. Isn't that just like our God who loves us so much? He's already blessed us so much with his son, Jesus, and his death and his burial and his resurrection. And the more that we come and we give him praise through song, the more that we give him praise by leaning into his word, the more we praise him by receiving communion today and acknowledging what he's done for us through his son Jesus, the more it blesses us. I just think that's so incredible. So we're gonna receive communion together. And I just wanna say this as we receive the bread. This is our act of praise as we remember Jesus' sacrifice body. And now as we receive the cup, this is our act of praise as we remember Jesus' shed blood so that many could have their sins forgiven, take and drink. So church, when we just do what we just did, we proclaim Jesus' death and his burial and his resurrection until he comes again. Amen? Amen. And now we get an opportunity to give him praise through an active offering. Yes, we praise him through our offering. By receiving an offering, and that's what we're gonna do together, we're gonna receive an offering, we're gonna give him praise. We're gonna honor him by remembering that everything that we have is, is his already, and that he's given us so much and he's blessed us with so much, and that he asks us in the midst of, of what he gives us to trust him with a, a percentage whether that's 10% or whether you give 5%, whatever you've put on your heart to give, we're gonna receive a, an offering right now and we're gonna give God praise through our act of, of offering, of giving him our tithes and our, our monies. And so the opportunities that we have to do that are by giving uh, through the mail, whatever you decided to give, you can send it to uh, the church address or you can give online at bccmesa.com slash giving. Let me pray for us for our offering this morning. Father, we do give you praise and you certainly deserve all of our praise, all of our honor, and Father, all glory is due to you. And we are so thankful for the way that you've blessed us. Uh, Father, yes, uh, some of us, uh, the, the financial blessing, but Father, it's not just that. You've, you've given us the blessing of your son, Jesus. And Father, we're so grateful for that today. And because of the way that you've given to us, Father, we want to be, we want to be good givers. We want to be generous in, in the way that we give back to you. And Father, we're thankful that we can praise you through this time of offering. And we praise this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, hello and welcome to online service today. I'm so glad you joined us. I'm John and Abnett, one of the pastors here at Broadway. And uh, hey, listen, if you're online with us right now, you uh, will see the tab that says chat. Love to have you uh, dialogue with us a little bit about the message, about the service. So join in. We've got somebody hosting the chat and they'll be able to respond to you. So uh, once again, just so glad that you're, uh, you're watching the service right now. And today we're beginning a brand new sermon series called You're Not the Boss of Me. You're not the boss of me. And what we want to do is to be able to say no to the emotions that compete for control of our lives. And right now, a lot of us feel like we're sort of losing control with the coronavirus, the pandemic, and, and the, the voluntary uh, uh, solitude that we're all experiencing, where we're all being told, well, you can't do this, and you can't have that. And, and, and we miss the things that we're used to, like church. We all miss church, right? You and I miss church, and eager to get back together again, as we've been talking about. But all day, every day, it seems like right now, we're just losing control of whatever we had of in our lives. Uh, and, and because of that, I think all sorts of emotions are just bubbling to the surface like anger and fear and insecurity and worry and anxiety, maybe greed or guilt. I don't know. All those emotions s- tend to direct our lives. And over the next six weeks, what I want us to do is to work together to learn how to monitor those emotions that tend to dictate how our lives go. Got this sermon series idea from North, North Point Community Church, and uh, we've, we're adapting it for our own unique situation here as we navigate our way through this uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic and this virus. But I want to say this again. Nobody wants to be told what to do. Everybody wants autonomy. And that's not something that begins when you're adult. Uh, I, can, I can tell you this, even though I may not know you specifically in your situation, But I can tell you that way back in your early childhood, probably before you can even remember, you were already seeking to be your own boss. You were already seeking your own autonomy. And uh, and what we do when when we're somewhere around two or maybe three, uh, we tend to start defying our parents. Like this little three-year-old girl. She always liked to stand up in her high chair during mealtime, and her mother was sick of it. She'd stand up, and Mama would say, sit down. And finally, the mom said, you know what? You stand up one more time. I'm going to spank you. And she sat down. And she looked at her mom defiantly, glaring at her with her arms crossed, and she said, I'm sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. And that's what we do, isn't it? We're all standing up on the inside. We all want our autonomy. And that word autonomy is a good word. Uh, Autonomy means that I can do what I want to do when I want to do it with enough money to do it and enough money to get me out of trouble if and when I get caught. Autonomy is doing what I want to do when I want to do it with enough money to do it and enough money to get me out of trouble uh, when I get caught. We all want that that kind of autonomy. You, me, everyone. It's so tempting in life just to be able to want to call your own shots, which is why it's always so baffling when you see someone that's reached this incredible level of autonomy. They've got money, they've got, they built margin into their life, and then they do something stupid and just undermine their lives. They undermine their own autonomy. They make some boneheaded decision. And, and, and you wonder, why in the world did they do that? Why would they say that? Why would they, why would they be that way? But you know, you don't have to be rich or famous, right? I mean, we've all been there. We've all done that. All of us, right? And I think one of the key reasons that we get into trouble in our own lives, that we get ourselves into trouble, better said, is because we have these toxic inner voices that always cause us to stumble and fall. And a lot of times those inner voices are coaching us. See, the truth is that we get into trouble when we take our own advice And a lot of times we take the advice that we're getting from those toxic voices. I mean, how many times have I said or done something, have you said or done something that later on you look back at that episode, that experience, and you say to yourself, why in the world did I say that? What was I thinking? I can't believe that. Because there's a tendency in each of us to take our own advice, and our advice gets filtered through our own emotions. That emotion could be anger on your part, or, or fear, or greed, or guilt, or worry, or anxiety, insecurity. Those are the emotions that compete for control of what we say, what we do, uh, who we say it to, how loudly we say it. Our emotions are always competing 
for control of our behavior. In other words, our emotions are what motivate us to, to be who and what we are. So what we want to do during these six weeks that we're going to be together in this sermon series is learn to monitor those emotions. Learn to monitor, monitor what's going on inside of us that's motivating us. Now listen, if you're a Jesus follower, I have to tell you this is more of a suggestion. More than a suggestion, this is actually a command. Because Jesus wants us to go down deep into our own lives. He wants us to examine our motives, our emotions, so that we know why we are who we are and why we do the things that we do. Because if what Jesus says is true, and it is, then this should be the filter for our behavior. And if what Jesus says is true, as a Christ follower, that means those toxic voices inside of us, like fear and anger and all the others that I've talked about, that almost always make us regret on the other side of what we've done. Jesus says we need to learn to corral those emotions. We need to learn to monitor those emotions. Because I'm convinced that what Jesus says is true, and I'm convinced that we need to follow Jesus and what He tells us, and here's why. Because if someone is raised from the dead and can predict beforehand His own resurrection, then we should go, whatever you say, Jesus, whatever you say. Amen? Okay, so here's how the adventure begins. Uh, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 15. And Matthew, the gospel writer, Luke does this too, but uh, Matthew uh, tells us about a particular day in the life of Jesus. And, uh, you know, Jesus this particular day is with his disciples. And a lot of times the crowds are following along too. But this particular day, somebody else shows up as well. And Matthew tells us about this in verse 1. Matthew 15, 1. Some Pharisees and teachers of religious law now arrive from Jerusalem to see Jesus. And the reason that Matthew adds that Pharisees showed up from Jerusalem is because it's code that they're up to something. What these Pharisees are up to is not particularly good. I mean, they're not there for just a casual conversation. They didn't come all that way for that. And they're certainly not there because they want to become followers of Jesus. They're there because they want to trap him and trick him. What they want to do is to get Jesus in front of his disciples so that they can confront him about something, and here it comes. The Pharisees asked, why do your disciples break, break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. And right now, is there anybody that doesn't understand the importance of washing their hands? You know, the single most important thing you can do to ward off infection and disease and the, and the virus is to wash your hands. I've washed my hands so much, I've worn off the top three layers of my skin, and that's all I had to begin with, washing your hands. And so the disciples, the Pharisees say, they're not washing their hands before they eat, and we all think, gross, right? But remember, this is a semi-arid region, and they don't have an abundance of water just to go pouring it everywhere. But there's more here than meets the eye. And, uh, and this is a big deal, because the Pharisees mentioned the tradition of the elders. Now, what was that exactly? Well, uh, Moses, as you may know, when he was on Mount Sinai, received the Ten Commandments from God in those stone tablets, but not just the Ten Commandments, because in addition to that, God also provided to Moses and the Israelites about 600 other commands as well. Now, we know the Ten Commandments. We call those the, the Big Ten or the Top Ten, but but there were about 613 commandments that God had laid out for the governance of Israel as a nation. Well, along, along came some superzealous and highly religious, uh, religious leaders that didn't think that those 613 laws were enough, and so they added to those what's called a tradition of the elders or oral laws. They were, these were not written down. They were passed from one select group of men to the next select group of men, and, uh, and they would only bring those laws out. They would only apply them in certain situations, usually when it was to their advantage. Those, un those unwritten laws, uh, and almost always, whatever the tradition of the elders was, it almost always added to the burden of the people. And you can see the spirit of that is alive even today in Israel. Uh, for example, if you should happen to go to Jerusalem and stay in a, in a kosher hotel, uh, on, on the Sabbath, on Saturday, uh, you'll, if you do what I did, I made the mistake of getting onto what's called the Shabbat elevator. Shabbat means Sabbath. You get onto the elevator, and you don't push any buttons because the doors open and close automatically. Well, I was on the first floor, 
and, uh, and, the, and I got on, and the door closed shortly after I got on, and then went up to the second floor, and uh, the door opened. Nobody got on or off. Third floor. I was going up to the 10th floor. I had a long elevator ride that day because someone along the way decided that pushing a button was work. And so they automatically programmed certain elevators every Saturday, every Sabbath, uh, so that there's no work involved. That seems to be a tradition of the elders. And, uh, and that spirit was alive even in Jesus' day, and he was certainly aware of the tradition of the elders. And, and when you read the Gospels, Jesus just wasn't buying it. He wasn't into these, these secondary mysterious laws known only to a few that were handed down from generation to generation. Now, Jesus certainly believed in the law. He believed in the Torah. In fact, Jesus said, I, I didn't come to abolish the law. He says, I came to fulfill it. But when it came to these these uh, the ceremonial laws like, like washing your hands a certain way, going through this ritual where you had to do things just exactly right, Jesus just wasn't going to have any part of that. And I think we're all for washing our hands before we eat. I, I do. I hope, I hope you do. But the way the Pharisees were imposing it on the people, it just made God seem small and, and made God seem petty. And Jesus just didn't buy that. He said, oh, yeah? And then in verse 3, Jesus replied, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? In other words, you guys are using these traditions of yours to man manipulate the people. And then he points out their hypocrisy. Because one of God's written laws was you must care for your aging parents. But these people, the Pharisees, had, had developed a bypass around that particular law. And Jesus points out that hypocrisy. When he says, for instance, God says, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father or mother must be put to death. But you say it's all right for people to say to their parents, sorry, I can't help you, for I have vowed to give to God what I would have given to you. In this way, you say they don't need to honor their parents, and so you cancel the word of God for the sake of your own tradition. In other words, there's something that's clearly written that's spelled out by God but you guys have introduced this tradition of the elders to make a detour around God's law, God's command. And Jesus says, I'm just not buying it. He says, you guys are hypocrites. And then he quotes the prophet Isaiah who prophesied this. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And that's a very important verse. Let me read it again. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. It's a very important verse, and it's going to drive our conversation over these next six weeks. God was speaking through the prophet Isaiah centuries before Jesus, and what God was saying to his people was this, you guys have the religious lingo, you got all the religious words, but your hearts aren't there. You're, you're, you're far from me. You're, you're not even close. You've turned your religion into a game that you can always win. And I don't need to tell you this, but I will anyway, because down through the ages, that's what certain religious leaders have just had a tendency to do. They add their own rules to make religion a game, and it's a game only they can win. Israel was no different than that. They were doing the same thing. The reason there was so much tension around Israel, and especially around the temple in Jerusalem, was because the religious leaders had so diluted the teaching of God that had been clearly given on Mount Sinai that it was almost unrecognizable and it was always to their own benefit. Well, Jesus doesn't waste this opportunity. He gathers the crowd so they can hear this exchange. Then Jesus called to the crowd to come and hear. Listen, he said, and try to understand. It's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. You're defiled by the words that come out of your mouth. Yeah, it wouldn't have been great to have been there in that moment. Jesus kind of drops a bomb on them and drops the mic and then walks away. In other words, our God is not a small God. He's not a petty God. He's not a gotcha type of God that's just looking for people to mess up. But I'll tell you what Jesus says. It's not what goes into your mouth. It's the words you vomit out. Those things are what defiles you. And then he drops the mic and walks off with, the, with his disciples and and the disciples are, you know, kind of walking along, trailing Jesus, and they're looking back, and they're, they're thinking, hey, take that, you guys. But like usual, the disciples don't have a clue as to what's just taken place. So in verse 11, the disciples came to him and asked, 
Do you realize you offended the Pharisees by what you just said? Do you realize? You know, probably the last thing in the world you need to say to Jesus is, hey, did you know? Or to God, hey, are are you aware of something? Like sometimes, you know, when we pray, we think we have to inform God of the situation before we can ask him for what we want. You know, it's like as if God doesn't know. Listen, he knows everything. There's nothing hidden from God's sight, right? Jesus, when he taught his disciples to pray, said, now, when you pray, just realize that your heavenly Father already knows what you need before you ask him. And you're wondering, well, why should I ask then? If he already knows, what's the point of asking? Well, because that's what people in relationship do. That's why we should ask. So the disciples asked, did you know that you offended those guys back there? And to which Jesus replies, just leave them. Just leave these guys. You know, there was a time when it was okay to follow the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders, but, but those days are over. Um, they've, they've, they've so abandoned God's law. They've so abandoned God's intent that they've made the religion a business. So just leave them. Th- these guys are spiritually blind. Then he offers a parable where he says, if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. At which point Peter asks for clarity. Uh, because even though the, the, the disciples got a kick out of Jesus dissing the Pharisees, they, they're just not really getting it. They don't understand. And when you read this next verse, it almost makes it sound like Jesus is sort of abrasive and stern with the disciples, but I don't quite see it that way. I think that, that Jesus realized that there's a learning curve going on here, and the disciples are, are slowly but surely coming along in the ways of the kingdom of God. And so maybe Jesus, you know, kind of playfully, I don't know, ruffles Peter's hair and says, come on, don't you get it? And then he explains. And, and, and part of this is humor. Uh, because Jesus' humor shows through in this next verse. And, and I want you to remember something that when you read the account of Jesus and his disciples, these are not two-dimensional cardboard cutouts. These are real people with real relationships. And they're having, they're having you know, a, a, a good time, I think. In fact, I, the, one of the things about Jesus that's striking is how often people were attracted to him. Well, sour pusses don't attract anybody to them right? It's people that smile, uh, that, that can find humor in life. Those are the ones that seem to attract people to them. And so I think Jesus was exactly like that because in verse 17, he says, don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out the body? Enters the stomach and then goes out the body. And, and they're like, oh yeah, what we eat, you know, we digest it. And, uh, and then, it, yeah, we see the evidence of that a couple of times a day. And they're all laughing. Jesus says, whatever you put in your mouth goes into your, into your digestive tract and ends up in the sewer, right? And, and they all get it. There's no harm in that. But this next part, this is the part that you need to pay attention to because in this next part, this conversation that he's having with his followers, you get a key insight here, church, into what's valuable to God. And since this matters to God, it ought to matter to us. And I just want to say that if you're part of a church, or if you're part of a religious organization as you're watching this today, that they tell you, listen, if you want to keep in God's favor, you've got to do this. And if you want God to keep on loving you, you've got to do this. If you want to stay in God's grace, you've got to keep doing this. You ought to run from an organization that teaches something like that because it's not our works that earns our approval before the Lord, okay? And, and that's important to remember. So listen up here because this is one thing that Jesus was pretty consistent about throughout his ministry. Here's what he says in verse 18. But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. The things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and that's what defiles those people. In other words, Jesus says, your words, the words that you speak, those reveal your heart And if your heart's not right, if your heart's not clean, that's what defiles you because that's a whole nother story. And that's what your heavenly father and our heavenly father is most concerned with. And that word defile has spiritual connotations because it means to put you at odds with God. He says, you want to know what puts you at odds with God? It's not accidentally eating something. It's not accidentally violating the tradition of the elders. It's not accidentally doing anything. What makes you spiritually unclean is what comes out of your mouth. 
That's what puts you at odds with God, especially when what comes out of your mouth puts you at odds with the people God loves. When what comes out of your mouth hurts or offends or harms the people that God loves, that is what defiles you. Because the theme of Jesus' teaching and the consistent theme is this, God loves you. He loves you with all of his heart, but he also loves the person sitting next to you right now. And he loves that person over there and, and that person over there. He loves everybody. In fact, he loves the people that are, in your mind, unlovable and unlovely. In fact, the most famous verse in the Bible says, for God so loved what? God so loved the world. God just loves people. And when you do something that hurts or harms someone that God loves, God's concerned about that. And God says that's how you defile yourself, not by offending God, because God is not so thin-skinned. God is not so sensitive as to be easily offended. No, it's when you're hurtful to someone that God cares about. It's when you're hurtful to someone that God loves. That's what puts you at odds with God. Verse 18 again says, but the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. See, the things that come out of a person's mouth, they come from within. They come from that person. They originate within. The source of your defiling, the source of your problematic words, the source of your problematic deeds is within you. And right now, you're probably saying, well, duh, tell me something I don't know. Or maybe you're pushing back right now and you're saying, well, come on, but, but no, I don't mean everything I say. I, I, I really don't mean that. I just say it, you know. I, there's no harm there. But Jesus would push back at that, and he would say, yeah, but, but you said it, didn't you? And it came out out loud. What you meant is you didn't mean to say it out loud because it can't come out of you if it's not in you. That's how it works. I think Jesus would push back. Then he says in verse 19, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. Out of the heart come all of these things. Now, in your chest cavity, there's this very important muscle called the heart. It's 12 ounces of tissue that basically are keeping you alive. But in this case, heart is a euphemism. It's a metaphor for your human experience and the things that we're aware of that tend to undermine our lives. Come on. I've undermined my life at times. You've undermined your life at times. And, and it's almost sometimes as if you're a, you're a third party. You can kind of step back and, and watch you undermine your marriage by the words you say or by what you do. You're undermining your marriage perhaps, or maybe you're undermining a relationship with one of your kids or something at work. And, and it's like, how could have I said that? How could have I have done that? That's what he's talking about. Jesus says those come from within. Those come from the evil thoughts because everything begins with a thought. Murder begins with a thought. Adultery doesn't begin when you hop in bed with somebody else's spouse. Adultery begins in your mind. It begins in your heart. Everything we do in life that's wrong or sinful is coming from within, coming from our lives, those, those embarrassing, career-killing, financially disastrous moments of our lives. Jesus says the source of all of that is your heart. These, he says, are the things that defile you. These are the things that put you at odds with God because they put you at odds with the people that God loves. But Jesus says to the Pharisees, come on, eating with unwashed hands? He says, that's nothing. So let me take you to the bottom line of this message today. What I want us to do over these six weeks is to, and I'm going to do this with you because I need to learn this as well. Uh, I, want to, I want us to practice monitoring our behavior by monitoring the emotions that drive our behavior, that, that drive our actions in, in our words. In fact, it would be helpful, I think, if we would personify some of this stuff that seems to lurk under the surface that sometimes derail our lives. And we're going to get into the habit of saying, you're not the boss of me. You're not the boss of me. In fact, it would be a good idea and helpful to you and me if you were to say it out loud. So at the count of three, I want you to say that. Ready? One, two, three. You're not the boss of me. Way to go. Now, this time I want you to say it with some conviction. You, one, two, three. Here we go. One, two, three. 
You're not the boss of me. See, I think it helps us to personify some of these emotions, some of the toxic emotions that many times will drive our actions and our words, like anger. Anger, you're not the boss of me. I know you anger. You try to justify making me say in what I do because of what he did or because of what she said. But anger, you're not the boss of me. And envy, you're not the boss of me. Envy, you make me look at him and wish I had his life, or you make me look over to her and think, oh, she's got it all together, wish I could live that way. But envy, you're not the boss of me. And insecurity, because of you I have a tendency to lie and, and to shrink back and not speak up when I should. But insecurity, those days are done because you're not the boss of me. Anxiety, oh, anxiety, you've, you've had your way during this last pandemic, haven't you? You've caused me to lose sleep at night. I worry. I wake up in a cold sweat. But you know what, anxiety and worry? You're not the boss of me. I want you to think for a minute how different your world would be if we could control those emotions that tend to drive us, if we didn't allow those to rule over us. And here's why, here's why this is so important. Whether you understand any of this, whether you embrace any of this, the people that you live with, the people that are closest to you, they live with the overflow of your heart every day. Just as you live with the overflow of their heart every day. And you can't do anything about that. But if you're a Christ follower, this is a really big deal. Because we already have a boss of us. A boss that's far better than worry and anxiety and fear and anger. This boss, Jesus says to us in one place in the Bible, in Matthew 11, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, all you who are tired of being bossed around by those inferior bosses, those of you who have been ruled by that inner anger or by that fear or by that insecurity, I'll give you something that those inferior bosses will never give you, rest. I'll give you rest on the inside. Another time Jesus says, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives you, because the world offers peace only when everything is going right on the outside. But Jesus says, I'll give you peace that you can have even when things are not going so well on the outside. I'll give you that peace that passes all human understanding. I mean, who doesn't want that? That's why Jesus said, follow me. And you know what? No matter who's been bossing your life around, this Jesus, the Son of God, is the best boss that you'll ever have. Let's bow for prayer. And Father, I thank you that Jesus offers himself to us to be our boss, to be the one who helps us to manage our lives. We're tired of being bossed around by those inferior bosses that we've been talking about, those toxic emotions like anger and insecurity and guilt and greed and fear and worry, all the things that tend to make us say and do the things that we regret, that we hate saying and doing. So, Father, help us to bring everything under the control and under the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray, amen. Thanks for watching today. Next week, we'll continue with part two of You're Not the Boss of Me.